Can you hear now? Yes, now we can hear. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, I will make a very short presentation, although I think that Dr. Schoenberger doesn't need any presentation. In any case, uh, as you all know, I think he's one of the this most important scholars in the field okay. of the fourth submission. Extending embedded uh, embodied the active mind and in general of the philosophy of mind. I just recall the most recent books by him. Uh, the Venetian lectures, he made it the last one yeah, yeah, that so. was published as well as an Italian publisher, Action and Interaction 2020, Oxford Handbook. Of four recognition phenomenology, the phenomenological mind that was translated recently also in Italy by Cortina, how the body shapes the mind, and this is yours. that you can uh, read them with the bibliography. And you can. He's currently professor so, of uh, philosophy. Know, it doesn't show, it doesn't show up there. Nazis. What especially interests us uh, in our seminar is his original and uh, I would say seminal approach to cognitive science through phenomenology and probabilities. Uh, maybe a few of us uh, uh, remember that the first publication of Sean Gallagher there were on Hegel and history and on human medical themes, especially in the So this is a particular interest in our seminar. Thank you. We came to the practices and uh, last year it was the title that the terminology, hermeneutics, post-structural intimate. Uh, in, in the light of the pragmatics. So I give uh, the floor. The title uh, of uh, your talk is perfectly coherent uh, with uh, the seminar because uh, it is the inside story, nature, and the intersection of phenomenology and pragmatism. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for inviting me. It's uh... I'm happy to be back in Milan. Uh, so, yeah, the title of uh, my presentation is The Inside Story, Nature at the Intersection of Phenomenology and Pragmatism. And I'll, I want to start with three quotations. Uh, one is from John Dewey, who, who writes, Nature yeah, is an artist that works from within instead of from without. Uh, the second quote I have from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who, uh, after reading Dewey's book, um, says, although Dewey's book, Experience in Nature, is incredibly ill-written, uh, it seemed to me, uh, after several rereadings, to have a feeling of intimacy with the inside of the cosmos that I found unequaled. So he, he liked it in the end. Um, and the uh, final quotation I'll start with is uh, from Merleau-Ponty, uh, who says, nature is different uh, from a simple thing. It has an interior. Uh, it's determined uh, from within. So all of these, uh, in some way, are pointing to this theme uh, that I'm referring to as the inside story. So here is a uh, an outline. Um, I'll start... Um, by saying just a few words about uh, what I'll call a pluralist philosophy of nature. Um, and then I'll look at some initial intersections, uh, intertwinements, uh, by which I mean the uh, intersections between uh, John Dewey and Merleau-Ponty to some extent. Um, I then will take a, a look uh, more at the philosophy of biology, behavior and embryological development, 
Um, there's a metaphor then that comes from Merleau-Ponty about a tapestry that I'm going to exploit. Uh, and finally, I will say something about, I hope uh, when I get there, about nature. So I start with this notion of a pluralist philosophy of nature. A philosophy of nature um, should be, I think, not a narrow philosophical enterprise, but an eclectic, pluralist, interdisciplinary project. Um, a lot of times when we think of uh, the philosophy of nature, we think uh, that it's focused or centered around physics, and that physics somehow or other gives us the right framework in order to understand nature. And of course, you know, going by the etymology of the, the term physics, uh, it's about nature in some very basic way. Um, but there are other disciplines uh, that also are very much uh, concerned about nature, uh, disciplines from anthropology and biology uh, to the climate sciences, to cognitive science, uh, to psychiatry, to questions about nature versus nurture in developmental studies or ontogeny uh, and so forth. So I think there are in fact a, pl a plurality of sciences that in some way touch upon nature and in fact are concerned with nature. So if we take this kind of de facto pluralism seriously, it presents a, I think, a genuine challenge for any project that hopes to be a philosophy of nature. We might end up with questions such as, why would one starting point be preferred over another? Should we start with physics or biology or something else? Would biology and physics, uh, for example, necessarily direct us to the same answers uh, or even to the same questions? George uh, Santayana, in his critical comments on John Dewey's experience in nature, suggests that any starting point other than what he calls and claims to be his own position, um, a dogmatic naturalism, is simply, as he puts it, a story. He says, in nature, there is no foreground or background, no here, no now, no moral cathedra, no center, so really central as to reduce all other things to mere margins and mere uh, perspectives. So this is what I would uh, call uh, nature without an inside, uh, nature just from the outside, uh, looking in, uh, looking at it, uh, so to speak, Santayana's view. And Dewey rightly takes issue with this view he contends that in nature there is a center and therefore a foreground and a background, a here and a now. And the center turns out to be you, or let's say the embodied agent, <clears throat> which means that in nature there are many centers, foregrounds, backgrounds, here's and now's. Uh, or in some sense, nature just is what exists in this set of multiple perspectives. This suggests a, a naturalism that is not just stereoscopic, as Wilford Sellers puts it, um, but uh, one that is, we might say, kaleidoscopic. And here is what Dewey says. He says, there are in nature both foregrounds and backgrounds, here's and there. Uh, centers and perspectives, foci and margins. Uh, if there were not, the story and the scene of man would involve a complete break with nature, the insertion of uh, unaccountable and unnatural conditions and factors. So for Dewey, the plot of the story unfolds across a number of perspectives that are anchored within nature. And this is what I'm going to refer to as the inside story. So I think Dewey is concerned with the inside story in contrast to Santayana. Perspectives, uh, the type of perspectives we're talking about here are not just individual perspectives, not just social perspectives. Uh, for Dewey, of course, um, these perspectives are, in fact, social, 
And, and that was an accusation that Santayana uh, made towards Dewey. He thought this this would not work as a as a way to think of nature. Uh, but Dewey certainly accepted the idea that the social was an important aspect here. But I also want to say that they are also disciplinary. Um, it's possible, I think, to tell this story from a number of disciplinary perspectives, not just physics, um, but also biology, anthropology, and aesthetics, and so forth. And I'm going to, uh, in, in this talk, develop the story from the perspective of biology, and uh, specifically embryology. And I'm going to do that for three reasons. First, because I think it will be productive to discuss this issue uh, at the intersection between pragmatism and phenomenology. And the focus on biology is one of the common roots taken by both Dewey and Merleau-Ponty. Second, it highlights some very indirect historical connections between these two thinkers that are not usually noted. And third, because the contemporary discussion about naturalism often turns on questions about biology. I'm not going to have a time to develop that this last point. Um, this is a point that in fact has relevance to uh, inactivism, questions about habit, consciousness, and so forth. But uh, I want to point, uh, at, at any rate, to a useful distinction related to the issue of disciplinary perspective uh, made in a recent paper. Uh, and this is a paper by Nehas and Sachs. They argue that these debates are important for both biology and the philosophy of nature, but in different ways, which think uh, which they think often gets uh, confused. So on the one hand, for biology, the question is, they say, whether an organism-centered account uh, of teleological descriptions would improve our descriptions uh, and explanations of biological phenomena. On the other hand, for philosophy, the question is how such concerns about naturalized teleology would impact our concept of nature and our self-understanding as natural entities. So they want to distinguish um, uh, yeah, uh, how biology might be served as opposed to how philosophy might be served uh, by uh, exploring the kinds of questions um, here about uh, perspectives and uh, and the, the notion of nature. These are then two quite different kinds of questions, and I, I won't address the meta-theoretical issues, uh, but in my discussion of Dewey and Merleau-Ponty, I focus on the second question about the concept of nature and our self-understanding. But I also think that one can only get to that question by working through the first question about the nature of an organism and how that works itself out in biology. So the beginning that we'll start with is specifically the beginning of animal life uh, as it is discussed in embryology. Uh, turns out that both Dewey and Merleau-Ponty had concerned themselves with research on embryology in contexts where they are trying to answer questions about nature. Merleau-Ponty, for example, finds a principle in Arnold Gussell's study of embryology that counts more generally as a principle of nature. It's something that Gussell called the principle of reciprocal intertwining. Merleau-Ponty explains Gassel's insight, which downplays linear development. For example, he says, and this is from his lectures on nature, uh, Merleau-Ponty says, before the stabilization of the behavior of pronation, development is made sometimes from the side of extension, sometimes from the side of flexion, Life does not present a unified front. It pushes forth from points here and there. 
pronation is about how our, our feet basically are angled in terms of uh, our ability to walk and so forth. Uh, but he's looking at some of the details of exactly how that works. And, and he's, what he's finding uh, is precisely the kind of principle that Gassel is, is uh, offering. So Merleau-Ponty, in his lectures on nature, is taking up Gassel and C.S. Uh, Amatruda's account of behavior uh, in the embryo from their 1945 book, The Embryology of Behavior, which was translated into Fr uh, French in uh, 1953. So he's working with, Merleau-Ponty's working with that French edition in the, in the early 50s. In this regard, Gassel follows and builds upon the work of George Coghill, who is also extensively discussed by Merleau-Ponty, who cites his work, Anatomy and the Problem of Behavior, which, which was uh, published in 1929. Um, Merleau-Ponty says, Coghill's experiments pose a question which is at the center of this course, his course on nature, um, on the idea of nature and maybe the whole of philosophy. The centrality for Merleau-Ponty, uh, however, is not the only uh, reason uh, to focus on Coghill. Uh, that uh, sorry, it's not the only reason that we're focusing here on on this discussion in Merleau-Ponty. Uh, rather, it's the proximity to Dewey, uh, because I think this whole discussion that Merleau-Ponty has, a great detailed discussion in his lectures on nature of, of Coghill and Gassel, really pushes him to within a hair's breadth uh, of Dewey. Uh, Dewey and uh, Merleau-Ponty never you know, met each other. I don't think they ever read each other as far as I know. I never found any mention of one in the other or anything like that. Um, uh, and yet this whole discussion that Merleau-Ponty is having is really a discussion that Dewey uh, also uh, is associated with. So although Dewey, uh, uh, who died in 1952 and Merleau-Ponty, who died just a little uh, time after that in 61, uh, were contemporaries. Uh, as I said, I don't think they read each other's philosophical works. Uh, but in contrast, Dewey, Coghill, and Gassell knew each other uh, under conditions of mutual influence. They, they had influences on each other. So uh, this, the story is that, uh, uh, I, I believe this is in the 1930s, uh, Arnold Gassell and uh, George Coghill, together with Frederick uh, Tilney, um, gathered around a developmental psychologist named Myrtle McGraw, who uh, had a, a lab that studied babies or infants, uh, infant development. And uh, I'll, I'll let her explain. Um, she says, Coghill visited my lab um, many, many, many times sometimes with Tilney, sometimes not. We talked and exchanged ideas. It was he, John Dewey, and the babies that got me thinking of process, not end result or achievement. Had he, Tilney, um, she means, uh, lived longer, Tilney, Coghill, and Dewey, and I, and let me say also the babies, uh, might have arrived at a synthesis of the meaning of structure and function. So the, there was something of a small community of researchers that included Dewey uh, and Coghill, uh, uh, as, as well as Gassell and uh, Myrtle here. Okay, so uh, I think then in, in terms of Meloponti's discussion of uh, Coghill and uh, Gassell, and he's really talking about Dewey's friends here uh, in some uh, important way. Merleau-Ponty's discussion of Coghill and Gassell uh, is found in the sections of his lectures uh, on nature entitled The Notion of Behavior. Setting aside John Watson's anti-mentalist notion of behavior, Merleau-Ponty makes an implicit reference to his own earlier work, his first work, which was called The Structure of Behavior. He says in the lectures, we discover 
between the situation and the response, an internal articulation that we understand, uh, but that we cannot reduce to its elements. And in the structure of behavior, he had associated this internal um, articulation with the notion of structure or form or gestalt. In the lectures on nature, he mentions the psychology of intentional behavior, where he says, behavior remains something anchored in the body, but the body is no longer a machine. And if the body uh, involving an internal articulation is no longer a machine, consequently, behavior becomes a quasi-organic reality. And here he says, Gesell. He's refer refer referencing uh, Gesell. Before uh, discussing, however, the significance of Gisele and Coghill from Merleau-Ponty, uh, note that what amounts to a, a kind of, um, I, I want to sort of note what amounts to a, a kind of a historical, unconscious, or implicit intertwining between Dewey and Merleau-Ponty, which puts them on the same ground, specifically on this topic of the internal articulation between situation and response. So what I'm referring to here is really what I would say uh, are the parallel analyses that you find uh, concerning behavior uh, in, in Merleau-Ponty's first book, The Structure of Behavior in 1942, and Dewey's <clears throat> well-known essay, The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology, which was much earlier, uh, 1896, um, on, almost 50 years earlier, um, an essay which uh, A.W. Moore considered, as he puts it, the primary essay in the pragmatic movement. So uh, if you're, fam if, I don't know how many people are familiar with the structure of behavior by Merleau-Ponty or with this essay by John Dewey, uh, some of you may be, but if you, if you ever, you know, pick up both of them and look at, at the two, uh, you might say they're saying the same thing. Merleau-Ponty seem, seemingly is sort of discovering maybe for himself what, what Dewey had already 50 years earlier uh, uh, found. So in the essay, uh, 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 Dewey's essay, uh, he rejects the preconceived and pre-formulated ideas of rigid distinctions between sensations, thoughts, and actions, which would then be conjoined in a mechanistic way. Such a conception entails a, a dualism of peripheral and central structures, so that the older dualism of body and soul finds a distinct echo in the current dualism of stimulus and response. So rather than thinking of these elements as fixed or separate entities, uh, Dewey argues that we should consider them in terms of functional divisions of labor that constitute an organic coordination. He says, the real beginning is with the act of seeing, um, uh, sorry. Sorry, I think he, uh, is there's something about this quote that's not quite right. The, the real beginning I think is not with an act of seeing, it is looking and not a sensation of light or it, you know, the act of seeing and looking are the same, same I, I guess the same thing here. So, but it's not about sensation, it's more about uh, per perception. Thus, a visual stimulus or a sound will have a different meaning depending upon the context of my action. In any case, he says, what precedes the stimulus is a whole act, a sensory motor coordination. And what is more to the point the stimulus emerges out of this coordination. It is born from it as uh, from its matrix. Uh, it represents, as it were, an escape from it. So stimulus and response uh, are not isolated elements in themselves, but are defined functionally as phases of a process that depend on wider contexts of uh, behavior. Merleau-Ponty, very much like Dewey, rejects the idea that stimulus and response are in a relation of linear causality. We are not passively waiting for a stimulus to happen. Rather, 
we seek out certain kinds of stimuli in our activity uh, in order to move towards a preferred state of excitation relative to some action context. So the agreement here with Dewey uh, is very clear. Merleau-Ponty emphasizes the idea of behavioral norms that orient the organism towards specific modes of behavior, right? And uh, we're not really talking about simply passive type responses. Uh, as he puts it, each kind of organism has a manner of elaborating the stimuli, which is proper to it. And this can be put, I think, uh, in more recent terms of affordance theory, if you're familiar with Gibson's notion of affordances, where an affordance is defined in terms of the organism-environment relation, such that different fields of affordances are relative to different kinds of organisms. What counts as a stimulus or an affordance uh, in such contexts will depend on physiology, uh, morphology, habit, skill level, as well as on, uh, on the ongoing action and the task at hand. As Merleau-Ponty uh, puts it, before any sy uh, systematic interpretation, the description of the known facts uh, shows that the fate of an excitation is determined by its relation to the whole of the organic state and to the simultaneous or preceding excitations that the relations between the organism and its milieu uh, are uh, not relations of linear causality, but of circular causality. I should note, uh, Gibson uh, was influenced by his reading of Merleau-Ponty here. Um, and Gibson also knew something of pragmatism. So um, he might have seen some connections here too. Under the influence of uh, Gestalt psychology, Merleau-Ponty thinks in terms of a synthesis of structure and function, a program that, if you remember, McGraw attributed to Dewey, Coghill, and her babies. Again, they're thinking very much along the same line. Structure for Merleau-Ponty is a gestalt that is not reducible to a Cartesian thing or res, uh, or to a collection of externally related parts. For him, as we'll see uh, as we go on, this has implications for how we think of nature. There's more to say about this kind of parallel analysis uh, uh, found in Dewey and Merleau-Ponty. Uh, Dewey, for example, distinguishes the, between the physical, the psychophysical, and the mental. Merleau-Ponty makes a similar distinction between what he calls syn syncretic forms, immovable forms, symbolic forms. I think there's a, a lot uh, that one could explore there. But I want to move on to ask about Coghill and Gassell and exactly what they add to this, uh, this kind of, I would say, common ground uh, uh, but sort of uh, where the, the two thinkers are not really uh, conscious that they are on common ground. Uh, so here I want to talk now about the embryological context. Uh, I think it's safe to say that when Merleau-Ponty finally found the work of Coghill and Gassell, he and Dewey were already on the same page, uh, even if they did not know it. And Coghill and Gassell had been on Dewey's page uh, for some time. Coghill, who was prone to quote Dewey's uh, prag uh, pragmatist principle, knowing is a mode of doing, uh, endorses Dewey's early essay on the reflex arc and rejects the idea that complex behavior must be constructed from a, sim uh, a set of simple reflexes. He argued that the individuation of partial, that is, reflexive behavior patterns emerges through the progressive restriction of a previously integrated total pattern, which is very much in tune with uh, what Dewey had been saying. For both Dewey and Coghill, there is a continuous reintegration uh, and and the term uh, the terms here are, are interpenetration and intersection, or, or reintegration of structural and functional traits in human existence. 
In his lectures, uh, Merleau-Ponty summarized in great detail the results of the experimental work that Coghill deal, uh, did on the axolot uh, lizard embryo, showing that uh, the assembly of the animal is not made piece by piece, but in a more holistic organization. For example, and here I'm quoting Merleau-Ponty's lectures, for example, the animal presents sketches of motor fibers before the development of musculature. And here the nervous system anticipates the development of the organism. The embryological development progressively realizes the individual parts anat anatomically and functionally at the same time that the behavior of the whole invades the periphery of the body. Coghill shows that there is an extra neural organization from which its behavior emerges, from, from the organism's behavior emerges. And the nervous system emerges from an extra neural dynamic. This extra neural aspect is morphological. So, for example, a differentiation between head and tail, or what will become head and tail. Um, and here, uh, again, is Merleau-Ponty. At the origin, the nervous cells are of the same kind. And what distinguishes them is the direction of conduction towards the head or towards the tail, following from which they are either motor or sensory. This direction of conduction does not depend on the nature of the cells, but rather on the extra neural polarity of the organism, which Coghill, he says, proves experimentally. A rhythmic movement uh, in the developing organism, uh, a flexing of the head in opposition to the tail, establishes a structure or a form into which the neural sensory motor circuit grows, where form and function are co-determined in a kind of bootstrapping process. So Coghill's work sets the principles of dynamic anatomy in opposition to strict mechanistic determinism. Uh, and this is something definitely that Merleau-Ponty uh, accepted. He says, Merleau-Ponty again from the lectures. Thus, when the nervous excitation occurs, it can't play uh, an appreciable role in the organization of the nervous system. This organization is not so much due to the functioning of the neuron as to the growth of the whole organism. The extraneural system of integration straddles the nervous functioning and it doesn't stop when it appears. So the nervous system can't be the ultimate explanation. One must acknowledge an intrinsic potentiality of growth, a dynamic system reacting to its surroundings as an organism would do. The function of nervous conduction is a consequence, not a principle of the system. So for Dewey, um, now in experience in nature, nature is conceived of as processes that reflect what we can call maybe trajectories. Processes of nature involve change, he says, proceeding from beginnings to endings, framed by anticipation, much as we find in Coghill's characterization of the teleological uh, uh, structure intrinsic to the organism. And so, too, for Merleau-Ponty, there's a kind of anticipation or teleology built into the organism. Uh, he says a growing possibility interior to the maturing organism. This organic fact, this fact of nature, involves an internal sequence for the maturing of its behavior. So as Coghill is rethinking the embryology of the lizard, um, 
And in this regard, it's addressing precisely that biological concern mentioned by Nehas and Sachs. Uh, Merleau-Ponty is focusing on the philosophical concern, uh, and he's trying to rethink nature, or at least this piece of biological nature. Still, apropos of the biological concern, he comes close to the notion uh, of autopoiesis, I think, um, as it was later developed by Maturana and uh, Varela. And this is the way he puts it, again, in the lectures on nature. He says, from the beginning, the organism is a gestalt, an articulated organism, and in relation to this fundamental process, other facts like the nervous connections are secondary. We want to understand the animal. We thus must not resort to the nervous function of conduction as a static anatomy does. The organism is not just a telephone switchboard. In order to understand it, we, we must include in it the inventor or operator of the telephone. We, we could say that the exowatch lizard uh, is a telephone which invents and maneuvers itself. Coghill would say, creator of itself in a way that places itself in the functioning of itself. For Gesell, also, it's a principle uh, found in all of behavior, which relates to what he calls the auto-regulatory uh, fluctuation. And here, it's just here that Mer Merleau-Ponty turns to Gesell's work and highlights the idea that there are no borders between what the body is and its behavior. Um, its organization is for action. Citing Gesell's obs observations, Merleau-Ponty explains this in terms of possible derivations from a symmetrical resting state found in the human embryo, such that when there is movement, an asymmetrical pattern emerges. Uh, when one reaches or, or moves towards an object, there is uh, typically an extension of one side and, and a flexing of the other side. This just is a characterization of an organism capable of action. And indeed, such posture or kinesthetic, uh, uh, or kinesthetic moment uh, in its relation to the world involves a diacritical difference uh, in meaning. Postures have meaning uh, from Merleau-Ponty's uh, perspective. In his early work, Merleau-Ponty would consider this the emergence of operative intentionality in bodily movement. In this respect, he states in his lectures, later lectures, the animal body in its posture is in this way defined by Gassel as a take on the exterior world. So a form or gestalt emerges within this reciprocal character, the under of uh, body and behavior. Animality and human being are given only together within or in the interior of a whole of being, he says. So the continuity between nature and embodied purpose of action emphasized by Merleau-Ponty was already there in Dewey. Dewey highlights the organism's feelings in response to uh, natural events, which then become the basis for pragmatic reconstruction uh, when meanings become problematic uh, and require action. This just is what Merleau-Ponty calls the animal body's take uh, on nature, when he, uh, which he relates to Coghill's dynamic anatomy and Gassell's dynamic morphogenesis. He mentions, among other things, uh, Gassell's work on the development of heartbeat uh, prior to innervation and the development of the hand uh, and the emergence of prehension, uh, which he uh, uh, characterizes as the progressive assembly of performance. Merleau-Ponty's form, structure, or gestalt here is a seeming dynamical gestalt, 
um, that is intrinsic to the details of the morphogenesis uh, in the embryo. Hence, he says, the importance of the role of form rather than any one element in isolation. And by way of form, the organism is synonymous with possible behaviors in the future. Here he quotes Giselle, the organism is not a machine, but a state of great dynamism. Uh, and that's from Giselle's 1945 book. A commentator Hansen uh, argues that this is a novel conception of emergence uh, to be distinguished from the concept of Gestalt in Merleau-Ponty's earlier work. Um, I would rather say that it, uh, it clearly introduces a, a nuance into his earlier conception. And this is what he learns from his readings of Coghill and Gassell. So uh, there's some debate about you know, how much Merleau-Ponty changes from his early work uh, to his later work. And I'm, I'm more on the side of continuity. Uh, I think that there are some, uh, I think, very interesting connections between his earliest, uh, the structure of behavior and his his uh, one of his latest uh, works in, in the lectures on on nature. Um, others want to say that the, the, they they say that there's a, a contrast. Uh, I I think if there is a contrast, it's because uh, Merleau Ponty suddenly was reading these uh, embryologists. So Merleau Ponty uh, provides, I think, an insightful. Um, uh, but he also realizes it's an, an inadequate metaphor uh, about a tapestry, which on the front, uh, the visible side, uh, presents an, uh, an orderly, meaningful, expressive picture. This is a, a tapestry that I recently saw in the Palazzo Colonna in Rome. Uh, you can see it's very uh, complex, even uh, on, the, on the face of it. Uh, but the the uh, idea uh, that Merleau-Ponty has is that if you turn it over, you see even more complexity. Um, uh, turn it around to the typically invisible side, um, and uh, you might say the inside of that tapestry, and what you find is a multitude or a network of, of threads that are difficult to understand. All right. And... Uh, what he says about this, uh, he says, compare Gassel. Uh, his work, uh, uh, his work is sort of on the reverse side, the really complex side of things, as with a tapestry. But man, most of us think in terms of the right side or the front um, as being the most rational part of it. As Merleau-Ponty realizes, the metaphor captures the complexity of threads that leads to the emergence of a meaningful pattern. Uh, but it is inadequate to capture the dynamical process involved in biological phenomena. A number of commentators uh, have emphasized for Merleau-Ponty, form emerges expressively, almost as if the way Dewey put it was uh, that art or sorry, that nature is an artist that works from within uh, instead of from without. So I want to look inside the tapestry here. Uh, so just at this point, it's tempting to shift the analysis from the perspective of biology uh, to, to the perspective of art uh, and to foreground the fact that both Dewey and Merleau-Ponty thought that art can also tell us about the inside story of nature. Uh, and remarkably, I think in this regard, for both thinkers, Matisse plays a central role. This is a portrait of Dewey by, by Matisse. Uh, they, they met and he actually did a portrait for, for Dewey. For Dewey who interacted with Matisse, art brings us closer to nature than theoretical science does since theory, he says, is satisfied with knowledge of nature um, rather than the primary experience of nature that you find in art. And Merleau-Ponty expresses a very similar idea. 
he begins his lectures on nature by saying, there is nature everywhere there is life that has meaning, uh, but not where there is thought. Nature is what has meaning without this nature being posited by thought. It is the auto-production of a meaning. And again, he says, our concern is not for a theory uh, of knowledge of nature. So I think he also wanted to get to the primary experience of nature. In, uh, this is uh, from a, a letter to Barnes, um, uh, Barnes who uh, collected and hosted Dewey at, uh, at his home in, uh, in Bryn Mawr. Uh, Dewey writes, if anyone ever writes the actual psychology of the artist's processes in creation, it will be through access to waste paper baskets and discarded sketches and so forth. It was interesting to see Matisse's hands move in the rhythm of his forms when he was showing his sketches. There was something in the gestures of, uh, of Matisse, he says, when uh, he was being, uh, when he was showing his sketches and so forth. Aesthetic uh, form involves the operation of forces that carry the experience to its own integral fulfillment, according to Dewey. And I think this brings us back to the biology and specifically to Cog Hill and Gesell. Merleau-Ponty sees the same connection, referencing again his tapestry metaphor. He says, Matisse threw his brush in as many diverse places as possible. And after a certain time, logic appeared. It's the same thing for the body of behavior in Gesell. Threads are tied up, which come from everywhere and which constitute independent forms. And at the same time, he finds that these threads realize something which has a unity. So what Dewey calls primary experience emerges from the detailed processes that are specified by Coghill and Gassell. So this last section uh, uh, on nature, returning to the kaleidoscopic uh, me uh, metaphor, nature includes many perspectives and has many senses. Nature as Santayana might conceive it uh, in a broad cosmological sense, is a sum total of objective facts that can be known, set up as an object that does uh, not include the subjective experience of the knower. In contrast, nature might be considered as the network of relations that science is investigating, which can include experience. Science attempts to explain this network but not from the outside. Science is itself embedded within the network that it studies. Science as a set of practices includes the products of history and culture, institutions such as astronomical ob observatories, uh, physical laboratories, libraries, archives, and so forth. And the practices involved in science uh, are skills, modes of know-how, of a human form, uh, but which are traceable, looking back through the trajectory, traceable to the basic skills that, and here is John Dewey uh, saying this, that are attributable to low-grade organisms, an expression of skill in selection and arrangement of materials so as to contribute to maintenance of the processes and operations constituting life. All animals know how, in virtue of organic structure and physiological processes, in connection with trans-cuticular uh, cut, uh, conditions, to do things of this sort. Dewey is, uh, I think, suggesting that our, our skills in doing science can be traced back to very primitive skills that really belong uh, to animals. Here there is continuity between experience, skillful doing, and nature, 
even as nature moves towards uh, science, or as Hegel might have put it, towards self-consciousness, uh, nature is not all of the same kind. Moreover, experience is like the inside of the tapestry. Dewey puts it uh, in this way, loaded with the tangled and complex. It includes foregrounds, backgrounds, here's and now's. As he puts it, all modes of experiencing are ways in which some genuine traits of nature come to manifest realization. Once you add dynamical processes to this complexity, uh, you, you get even more complexity um, and, and you get process. Uh, Dewey says to exist is to be in process, in change. Dewey here considers an objection raised by Morris Cohen, uh, not to the pluralism involved in nature and experience, but to the limitations of our experience. This is the idea that any particular experience will limit our access to nature, preventing us, and here's Dewey explaining the objection, preventing us from formulating any adequate theory of non-human or physical nature, or limiting a philosophy that makes experience primary to human affairs uh, as its sole material, and excluding propositions about such things as, say, the origin uh, of life on Earth or the events of geolog geological ages preceding the advent of man and hence of necessity human experience. Dewey's answer to this objection, however, is that experience, shaped by the very nature of the experiencing organism, is the only access we have to non-human nature. And that's a point I think that's long been defended by phenomenologists. Cohen's objection appears to be based on an assumption shared with Santayana that there is a discontinuity between experience and nature. Uh, we look at nature from the outside. Yet such experience is grounded in the natural organism um, and there is clearly a continuity. Experience is in touch with nature because it is part of nature. To quote here, uh, someone who I think is a non-pragmatist, uh, Roy Wood Sellers, Wilford's father, um, he has this nice phrase, however, he says, only with consciousness are we on the inside of nature. The worth or value of scientific conclusions uh, is based on the fact that in experience, there is no isolation, Dewey says, of the material of knowledge. Rather, there is a continual interaction with the things of other forms of experience. And the worth or reality of the former is to be judged on the basis of the control exercised by it over the things of non-cognitive experiences and the increment of enriched meaning supplied to them. In this respect, the other forms of experience include things like artistic expression and performance, as well as human friendship and social practices. All of this could be reframed in, in terms of physics. As Dewey puts it, what is known is seen to be a product in which the act of observation plays a necessary role. Knowing is seen to be a participant in what is finally known. Uh, Merleau-Ponty echoes that same point. He says, physics has taught us to break with the common notion of a space and time without reference to the observer's situation and enables us to give full ontological significance to uh, certain descriptions of perceived space and time, to polymorphous space and time of which common sense and science retain only few traces. Dalton indicates the indirect connection uh, that Dewey had through his daughter Jane with Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg and their discussions in Copenhagen. His daughter was a physicist who worked with Bohr uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and he also notes that Dewey believed that the essential indeterminacy of matter that Heisenberg proposed and that post-impressionists like Matisse expressed through their paintings, 
supported his supposition that mind and nature were integrated through experience. And on this point, Merleau-Ponty cites Niels Bohr, uh, who finds experimental biology equally constrained. Bohr says, in every experiment on living organisms, there must remain an uncertainty as regards the physical conditions to which they are subjected. And the idea suggests itself that the minimal freedom we must allow the organism to maintain its life is just large enough to permit it, so to say, to hide its ultimate secrets from us. And in his structure of behavior, Merleau-Ponty suggested that we need to rethink nature to find the tr what he called the truth of naturalism, and that it uh, and that is what he is doing, I think, in his uh, later lectures on nature. Moreover, I think this is what Dewey uh, has been doing all along. The truth of naturalism, as Merleau-Ponty uh, in the structure behavior puts it, is not to be found in the classic mechanistic conception of nature. Rather. We need to conceive of nature in terms of form, structure, gestalt, or in his later work, he called this flesh, a kind of intertwinement where nature is not independent from the perceiver uh, or the agent. And this is a view that I think reinforces what Dewey had explicated in his essay on the reflex arc. It's not just a subject independent environment that defines what counts as a stimulus for the organism, but as Merleau-Ponty puts it, the organism itself, according to the proper nature of its receptors, the thresholds of its nerve centers and the movement of its organs, which uh, chooses the stimulus uh, in the physical world to which it will be sensitive. So in his lectures, as Merleau-Ponty completes his discussion of Gassel, he notes that Gassel considers behavior to emerge from the morphology of the body and not from a source exterior to the organism itself. For Dewey, changes in the organism form a history or a set of changes marked by development or growth. The reality is the growth process itself. What the, study, what the studies by Coghill and Gassel confirm for both Dewey and Merleau-Ponty is that we find the truth of naturalism in or inside nature itself, which includes us. And this is the same thought that Merleau-Ponty expressed in his structure of behavior. Each form, gestalt, structure, constitutes a field of forces characterized by an internal law, which has no meaning outside the limits of the dynamic structures considered, and which, on the other hand, assigns its properties to each internal point so much so that they will never be absolute properties. And so this again, I think is the inside story, which suggests that there is no one set of laws that apply equally to all forms or, or all fields. Or as Dewey put it, nature is not all of the same kind. Hence the idea of the philosophy of nature as an eclectic pluralist interdisciplinary uh, project. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much for this uh, very rich work in you know, the department of philosophy and for sure challenging for everyone. But, so, if there are questions also from home, let's see if in the chat. If you have questions here, yeah, you can um, write them in the chat or uh, make it by that to the question. Thank you, Sean, for this very rich. Non so se vuoi così sento anche a casa. Thank you so much for this uh, very rich talk. Uh, was uh, I, I 
I feel that it's very insightful for all of us. I have a um, question about the term of teleology that you use uh, in your presentation in relation to form, because teleology is uh, a critical term for biologists that, uh, that came from the, the Darwinian framework. But I know that uh, if teleology is not used as a proposal, process that is conscious, I think that could work, for example, uh, in, in the terms of Jacques Monod and the chance and necessity, teleonomy. I don't know if uh, it, this is the same uh, concept that, uh, the, that you want to use uh, yeah. when, when you speak about teleology, because I know that, for example, we use very much the terms of, of teleology when we speak about, for example, motion, cognition, and so I think uh, uh, there is maybe um, if you if you could say a couple of things about this, uh, because biology is one thing and conscious uh, human affair is another. Yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly, uh, I, I understand the notion of teleology and evolutionary theory is controversial, right? Um, I, the way I take it, and the way I think it's uh, it's discussed uh, in in these uh, thinkers uh, uh, and in the kind of embryological context that they were working uh, is it's uh, something that just is in the organism. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's not a, uh, a kind of super principle of all nature, uh, you know, that would take nature in a big uh, direction or something like that. But it's sort of built into the very um, development uh, of uh, of the organisms that they can see uh, in their experiments. Um, and um, I know that uh, also um, um, Francisco Varela. Uh, has has talked about teleo teleological, I think, in the same way. Um, so I think, yeah, I, uh, definitely, it's one one topic that I think we uh, we probably need more to to think about that and to, to talk to to discuss that and and figure out what it really means. I think it would be uh, interesting to try to see what it means here in 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 these theorists and to see whether it compares with the kind of way that someone like Varela is talking about it a little bit later on. Uh, I have a feeling that it does, but you know, I think uh, I don't know for sure. Just one, one little addition. Yeah. There was um, uh, I think uh, a great uh, philosoph uh, historian or philosopher here in Milan, that is Francesco Boiso, that uh, worked a lot of Nietzsche and theology. And he proposed to speak about local teleology mm. in a um, multi level framework that, um, like you said before, um, intertwine each other. So if, if uh, we see teleology not in a cosmic way, but uh, uh, a multiplicity of local technologies that uh, um, that uh, uh, in a way gives place to a form that is organized from the beginning mm -hmm. of the nature. I think that uh, we are in yeah. the same uh, the same perspective that you showed to us. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And Thank yeah. I I think I agree with that. Yeah. I can pose a question. Okay. Waiting for someone else. Um, I was very interested in the position about the uh, um, action, the act of seeing the you quoted the do it. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, the notion of uh, force that in some sense uh, seems to contrast with that uh, of the form. I know that Norbo Ponti uh, talks uh, of a form of Gestalt, but of course, uh, in a in different way than the Aristotelian way. But maybe it was not so clear that uh, um, 
storm decades and the notion of process in the notion of the interweaving of forces that go on together mm. without any stable and fixed um, form or, or perimeter. So I I want to know something more about that. If you if you can talk uh, some more about uh, this uh, uh, connection between form and force, uh, because nature, uh, in my opinion, is uh, better expressed by uh, this concept of forces and process and movements. I was. Uh, of thinking of Whitehead, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, Whitehead, this is very clear. And uh, and again, I um, would ask you if uh, this reference uh, to the act of the action forces is a reference to the notion of habit. And that is not exactly to the action, but to the disposition of acting, uh, to a person that would say the preparedness to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. So I think uh, what, what Villaponti describes. Uh, is what I would call a dynamical gestalt. Um, and it's a, in a, in a certain way, I think it's very consistent with the notion of process uh, and uh, and what uh, Paul Gill and Gassell are, are describing as well seems very much along the same line. So it's, not, it, you know, a gestalt, uh, if you think of it just synchronically, you know, it's kind of shape of some sort. But, but I think... Um, uh, Merleau-Ponty is thinking of it more in, in dynamical terms of, of a, a developing gestalt, a, a developing form, form not that stationary, but a, a form that, in fact, is dynamic in some fashion. Uh, and I think that's the right way to, to think of it. Uh, so uh, the emphasis on, on process rather than uh, anything static uh, mm -hmm. is, is clearly uh, in, these, in these authors. Um, and I think also, uh, when you think of habit, you have to think not a, of habit as this kind of, uh, there is to some extent some stability there, but it's not just strictly a stable thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's also something that is flexible, right? For Dewey, right? It's, it's not just something that repeats, you know, in each in different contexts or different situations, habit doesn't mean that we just do the same thing. It's intelligent in some fashion. And that means that it adjusts to the situation, uh, to to different contexts, which means it has to have a kind of dynamical character to it that, that allows for uh, uh, some kind of process of adjustment. Uh, so I think uh, one could think of yeah, habit in, in terms of uh, action scenarios, uh, the role of habit uh, being very important, uh, but also being uh, you know, conceived in terms of more uh, of a kind of dynamical process than anything uh, static. Anche in italiano possiamo, sì, in inglese è perfetto, ma dico se qualcuno ha problemi, è forse meglio per chi sente a casa. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the great presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I know that one concern of the 
Um, so right now, with toward the end of the presentation, you said something uh, like, "So we have we have this uh, even now, and if we add the, the dynamic structure, uh, we have even more complexity." But um, from from what I gather, the, the moral of the story you were telling uh, was that this is actually a bit better so that we first of all have the, the dynamic processes which form the, these dynamic structures which are essentially behavioral structures um, and then this, this kind of lows in the structures we have the, the year now so we can experience uh, but I think my concern is if we are to think of um, every possible experience in terms of these behavioral structures and if um, all organisms actually uh, do respond to, to, to this logic, to the logic of, of structure and the behavior of a dynamic organization. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a sense in which a, every living organism is inside nature as much as we are. Um, so we are we are no more in, in relationship to nature. We are not in a, in a privilege, privilege um, standpoint towards nature uh, compared to say lizards. So uh, on the other hand, when uh, one of the, the basic intuitions about science and enterprise is that it gives us a privileged standpoint towards nature. So. Uh, we reach a kind of activity which was uh, student before, and is the student from the front of life. Um, and that even though um, different disciplines have different standpoints, uh, and so we have different senses of nature, um, they somehow refer to the, the same thing in a way. Um, so I guess my my question is one one is lack of objectivity in, in this perspective, um, and how do the, the different senses of nature interplay, especially um, compared to the being taken into account in the structure of science and the class? Yeah. Um, All right. I think that's, that's a very large question, uh, and uh, I'm not sure I can do justice to it. But um, you know, there, uh, there's, for example, I I, uh, I quoted uh, that uh, Roy Wood uh, Sellers quotation about consciousness, uh, and I I hesitated in uh, in terms of putting that in there, but it was just so nice because he talks about the insight of nature. Uh, but I I didn't really want to say that it's uh, it's consciousness, and I'm not. Uh, I think one question has to do with what Dewey might mean by primary experience, um, and uh, how to characterize that, and whether uh, you know we, we could characterize it in such a way that it would include uh, non-human animals. I, I think it would uh, in some way, but it's also I think the uh, it's it's not. It's not just what we might call consciousness that's the inside of nature that gives us, in a certain way, a privilege, you know, in terms of our ability to do objective science and, and gain knowledge and so forth. Uh, but but it, it's also something like action. It's all, uh, it's something like the the various structures that that um, characterize. Uh, uh, behavior and action, even non-conscious type behaviors and actions, and so even, even in some sense, uh, you know, uh, non-human um, animals uh, of a much lower order um, might have a kind of inside, right, uh, to to nature that uh, is somewhat different though from ours. But uh, nonetheless, uh, still sort of in terms of their ability to behave the way they behave without necessarily being conscious. When it, when then, of course, when we get to say human consciousness and our 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 ability to do science, 
Uh, then I, th I think, of course, we have to allow for objectivity to uh, to play some role here. And then the question is, you know, how do we get to objectivity? And of course, we have lots of methods <laughs> that we use in order to uh, to control our experiments and so forth. And this is what we usually refer to as uh, a kind of objective uh, approach in science. Uh, but but without you know some of the, some of the drawbacks of uh, let's say experimental science, uh, some some of the great benefits of it, but also some of the drawbacks of it uh, is simply that uh, oftentimes we end up with a kind of abstraction um, because of the experimental situation, or and and uh, it doesn't tell us the full story, um, so we. We have to find ways to uh, uh, to put together that that full story, uh, and and then call something like that objectivity to the extent that we can make it coherent and make that story coherent and so forth. But as we all know, uh, we keep changing the story. Science keeps telling us different things. Uh, we keep discovering different things, and oftentimes they are. They're thought to be the final word, but in fact, there is no final word in science. So we, you know, absolute objectivity, anything like that is not there. Um, but a certain degree of objectivity based upon uh, methods that we can intersubjectively agree about, I think that's where we get objectivity from. I don't know if any of that is coherent, but <laughs> that's it. A lot of what you're you're asking is very, I think, difficult to answer. Yeah. If you want to read the place, there is a, a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, it says, uh, uh, thanks to Professor Gallagher for the stimulating and to the organizers. Well, unfortunately, I have to go now. Uh, okay, it's not a <laughs> it's not a question, but I would say, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you you can go. <laughs> um. I want to interrupt to summarize, but maybe it is exaggerated what I am saying. But just to know uh, if, if uh, things can uh, can be interpreted in this world in a way, can we say we we can say this? Uh, I think if. Uh, it has been said that we are nature and there is no difference between us and nature. Can we add that uh, nature is a word uh, of culture, is a cultural word, is uh, a word that uh, uh, declines a certain form of life, for example, a scientific form of life that uh, um, tries to give another view of energy. Nature is a word of our interpretive habit. Uh, and so maybe, or I, I try to interpret what you said this way, uh, it, it's not uh, an issue related to nature, but to experience what we have um, our search for. Nature is a too vague a word, I think. And it's too also metaphysical to, to be used in a truly philosophical context. Because nature, uh, nature many, many times uh, has a requisite uh, culture, but it's culture that poses uh, uh, the theme of nature. Because mm. it's better, as Dewey uh, said, uh, to speak of our experience of all of the phenomenological traditions as to speak of experience. That is our experience in the world and any any kind of experience. 
that may be even exaggerational respect to what you said. Yeah, so um, I think in, in some sense, you know, the term nature is something of an abstraction. It's a very, very general term, like attempts to capture something. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's something of an abstraction in a way. And then the question is, well, how how should we interpret that concept? And if you, you yeah, it's open to multiple interpretations, I suppose I would say, uh, and uh, much depends upon the kind of, you know, as I was trying to to show here, the kind of disciplinary um, stance that you take towards it. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I think the, the questions um, that I posed in the beginning, um, I think, yeah, the question is something like, you know, if we if we approach it by means of physics, are we going to get exactly the same answers that we'll get if we approach it by means of biology or art or whatever? And it seems to me that uh, it's very possible that we get different answers. Um, and, there, and then the question is, well, maybe nature encompasses all of that. You know, maybe that's the one way to, to conceive of it. And as you say, I mean, all of the these disciplines are, yeah, parts of uh, uh, human culture in, in some fashion, right? Science itself is a, uh, a cultural practice um, that it attempts to, you know, go beyond being just a cultural practice, I suppose. Um, but again, I think uh, taking a, a more pluralist view, uh, taking nature to be something, you know, generally speaking as an abstraction, taking a pluralist view uh, and asking what the different sciences can tell us, uh, I think it is a step towards um, uh, seeing that uh, that nature might be a very, very rich concept uh, all the, at the same time that it's an abstract and that we can fill in and say a lots of different and interesting things about nature by taking all the very various, you know, different approaches to it, to that topic. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, if there are any other questions, we can say goodbye and thank you to everyone. And, uh, yeah. Next. Thank you. Next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to record this for sale. If someone wants. Yeah. They must know. They must be here. That's fine. Yeah.